Chapter 7, Among Friends. Virginsky lived on Ant Street in his own, that is, his wife's house. It was a wooden one-story structure, and the Virginskys were its only occupants. About 15 guests had gathered there on the occasion of the host's birthday, but the party didn't look at all like what one would expect a provincial birthday party to look like. From the beginning of their life together, the Virginskys had decided it was stupid to invite guests on their birthdays and that a birthday was not an occasion to celebrate anyway. In a few years, they had managed thoroughly to isolate themselves from social life. He, although he was an able man in many ways, was generally considered a solitary crank, and an arrogant one at that. As for Mrs. Virginsky, she was a midwife by training, and that alone placed her rather low on the social ladder, lower even than the priest's wife, despite her husband's respectable official rank. However, she lacked the humility that should have gone with her humble station, and on top of that, after her affair with that crook Lebyatkin, an affair that had been shockingly open as a matter of principle, even the most broad-minded of our ladies had turned their backs on her with unconcealed scorn. Mrs. Virginsky, however, took it all as if that was just what she wanted, and it is worth noting that those same ladies called on her, Arena Virginsky, whenever they were in need of a midwife, in preference to three other local ladies who practiced that profession. She even received calls from estates outside town to attend the wives of landowners, so great was the trust they had in her competence, her luck, and her sure hands in critical moments. Finally, she confined her practice to the richest patients because she loved money passionately. Once she realized her power, she abandoned all restraints on her temperament. Apparently, during the performance of her duties in the most distinguished houses, she liked to scare nervous ladies in labor with her incredible nihilistic forgetfulness of all the rules of decency or by jeering at, quote, all that's holy, end of quote, at the very moments when, quote, holy, end of quote, things might be the most useful. Our local doctor, Rosanoff, positively assured us that once, when a certain woman, writhing in the pangs of childbirth, began to implore the Lord for help, Arena Virginsky delivered herself of a free-thinking phrase that acted upon the patient like a pistol shot, thus stimulating, through fright, a quick delivery. But nihilist though she was, Mrs. Virginsky did not turn up her nose at social prejudices, even the most old-fashioned ones, as long as she felt they were to her advantage. She would never, for instance, miss the christening of a child she had helped to deliver, and on these occasions she always appeared in a green silk dress with a train, with her hair specially curled, although at any other time she seemed to take special delight in appearing in public in the most slovenly attire. And although, to the great embarrassment of the officiating priest, she always assumed a scornful air during the christening ceremony itself, she invariably managed to be the one to hand the champagne around, that was why she dressed up and came in the first place, and heaven help a guest who, having taken a glass, forgot to put money on the tray for her, quote, good works, end of quote. The guests gathered at the Virginskys that evening, almost all men, were a motley lot. There were no drinks and no card games. In the middle of the fair-sized living room, which was papered in very faded blue, two dining tables had been pushed together. They were covered with an extra-large tablecloth that was not too clean and on it stood two big hissing samovars, a huge tray holding 25 glasses and a basket of sliced, unbuttered French bread, such as one would expect to find in a boys' or girls' boarding school, stood at the end of the table. The tea was poured by Irina Virginsky's 30-year-old unmarried sister, a taciturn and venomous virgin with no eyebrows, who nevertheless shared her sister's modern ideas and who inspired fear in Virginsky himself in his domestic life. Altogether, there were three ladies in the family, Mrs. Virginsky, her brella sister, and Virginsky's own sister. Mrs. Virginsky, the mistress of the house, was about 27, rather disheveled, but of quite imposing good looks. She wore an everyday woolen dress of greenish color and sat looking at the guests with shining eyes that seemed to say, See, there's nothing in the world I'm afraid of. Virginsky's sister, who had just arrived from Petersburg, was a rather well-fed, short, compact, red-cheeked, rotund university student and a nihilist. She sat next to her sister-in-law. Still wearing her traveling clothes and clutching some sort of a bundle on her lap, she examined the guests with her impatient, darting eyes. Virginsky himself wasn't feeling too well, but he appeared anyway and sat in an armchair by the table. The guests were seated on straight chairs around the table, stiff and dignified. It was evident that they were waiting for an official meeting to open. The atmosphere of general expectation was quite obvious, although while waiting, they conducted rather loud and extraneous conversations. When Stavrogin and Berkovinsky appeared, a dead silence fell.
I suppose, though, that at this point I should explain a few things to make the situation more understandable. I'm sure that each of these people had come to the meeting in the hope of hearing something interesting, something of which they had been given an idea beforehand. They represented the flower of the reddest liberalism in our ancient town and had been carefully handpicked by Virginsky for this conference. Let me note also that among them there were some, but only a few, who had never before been in his house. Of course, most of the guests had no very clear idea why they had been summoned, although they all thought that Peter Verkovinsky was an emissary from abroad with special powers. That notion had somehow caught on immediately and naturally was flattering to them. On the other hand, among the group there were a few who had received definite instructions. Peter had managed to form a five in our town and yet another five, consisting of army officers stationed in our district, along the lines of a cell he had previously formed in Moscow. They say that he also had a five in Kharkov province. Now the five members of our local cell were sitting at the table, but they managed to look so unconcerned and commonplace that no one could tell who they were. Since it is now no longer a mystery, I can say that they were Laputin, to start with, then Virginsky himself, then Mrs. Virginsky's brother, the long-eared Shigalov, Lyamshin, and one Tolkachinko, a strange man of 40 or so, who was famous for his profound knowledge of people, especially of swindlers and criminals, and who spent his time going from one dive to another, and not only in the course of his research on people. He stood out among us because of his badly cut clothes, his heavy laborer's boots, the sly look in his half-closed eyes, and the rather complicated colloquial expressions he used. Lyamshin had brought this man to Stepan Verkovinsky's gatherings once or twice, but he had failed to make an impression there. He usually turned up in our town when he was unemployed because he could get employment with the railroad here. These five would-be statesmen had joined this first cell in the unshakable belief that theirs was only one among hundreds and thousands of similar fives scattered throughout Russia, all controlled by some vast, mysterious central organization that maintained close contact with the European and worldwide revolutionary movements. Unfortunately, however, even at that time, signs of disaffection were beginning to appear among them. The fact of the matter was that, although they had been waiting for Peter's coming, which had been, an annou which had been announced to them first by Tolkachinko, and then by Shigalov, although they expected him to perform miracles, although they had immediately and un unquestioningly agreed to form the cell as soon as Peter had suggested it to them. As soon as they did so, they seemed to become full of resentment, perhaps precisely because of the eagerness with which they had agreed to it. Of course, their main reason for agreeing had been the fear that they might later be reproached for not daring to join. But still, they felt Peter Verkovinsky should have rewarded them for their generous gesture by revealing something really important to them. But Verkovinsky had never even thought of satisfying this legitimate curiosity and hadn't told them anything special. In general, he had treated them very roughly and rather disdainfully. That irritated them, and cell member Shigalov was already trying to stir up the others to ask Peter for an official account, but of course not now at Virginsky's because there were too many outsiders present. Speaking of outsiders, I suspect that the above-mentioned members of the first five suspected that among the guests gathered at Virginsky's that evening there were members of other fives organized locally by Verkovinsky and belonging to the same mysterious organization. So, the assembled guests were suspicious of one another, and each of them tried to impress the others by his attitude. This imbued the gathering with a confused, mysterious, and at the same time somewhat romantic air. There were, however, some persons who were above suspicion such as an army major, a close relative of Brzezinski's, who had arrived quite innocently, without being invited and couldn't possibly be turned away. Brzezinski wasn't worried about him because the major, although he didn't sympathize with their political ideas, quote, would never think of informing, end of quote, on them, since despite his stupidity, he enjoyed being among extreme liberals and liked listening to them talk. Moreover, he had been compromised once in his youth. Whole bundles of Hertzen's periodical The Bell and reams of subversive leaflets had passed through his hands, and although he had been too afraid even to unwrap them, he would have considered a refusal to distribute them as outright cowardice. To this day, there are many Russians like that. As to the remaining guests, they either belong to that bilious type full of frustrated romantic aspirations and pride, or to the type filled with the first impulse of generous youth. There were two or three school teachers, of whom one was past 45 and lame, a very venomous and remarkably vain man, and also two or three officers. One of these, a young artillery officer, a silent boy who had only recently been graduated from a military academy and who hadn't yet had time to make any acquaintances in our town, now suddenly found himself at Virginsky's holding a pencil and notebook in his hands. He kept jotting down notes and hardly said a word to anyone. Everyone noticed this, but for some reason they all tried to pretend they hadn't. Also present was the former divinity student who had helped Liam Shin smuggle the pornographic pictures into the bag of the woman who sold Bibles. 
He was a big fellow, overbearing but careful, with a reproachful smile combined with an expression of the utmost satisfaction with his own perfection written all over his face. For some reason, the son of the mayor was also there, that wayward, corrupted boy I mentioned before in the sad story of the second lieutenant's wife. He remained silent the entire evening. Finally, there was a hot-headed, tousled, 18-year-old schoolboy who wore a gloomy, offended expression, apparently suffering over being 18. This baby, we found out later to our amazement, was the head of an independent subversive group that had been formed among the senior class of the local school. I have not mentioned Shatov, who had installed himself at a far corner of the table. His chair was slightly out of line with the other chairs. He looked down, maintained a grim silence, and refused both tea and bread. He never once put down his cap, but held it in his hand all the time, as though he wanted to make it obvious that he was no guest, but was there strictly on business and intended to get out as soon as he was through. Not far from him sat Kirillov, who was also very silent, but who, instead of looking at the ground like Shatov, examined in turn all those who spoke. He regarded them with his black, lusterless eyes, listening to them in silence and without the slightest surprise or emotion. Some guests, who had never seen him before, stole sidelong glances at him. I can't say whether Mrs. Virginsky herself even knew of the existence of the five. I imagine she did, probably through her husband, but Virginsky's student sister was certainly unaware of anything. As a matter of fact, she had her own preoccupations. She intended to stay with her brother for a couple of days only, after which she planned to go farther, traveling from one university town to another to, quote, share in the sufferings of poor students and urge them to protest, end of quote. She carried with her a few hundred copies of a lithographed manifesto, I believe, of her own composition. It is interesting to note that the schoolboy conceived a deadly hatred for her from the very first glance, and that she responded to him in kind, although until then they had been completely unaware of each other's existence. The major was her uncle, and this was the first time they had met in ten years. When Stavrogin and Berkovinsky walked in, her cheeks were as red as cranberries because a moment before she had had a frightful row with her uncle that had been triggered by his views on the emancipation of women. Berkovinsky sprawled in his chair at the head of the table with emphatic lack of regard for the assembled company. He had hardly said hello to anyone and now looked around him with an air of haughty disdain. Stavrogin, however, bowed politely to everyone, although these people had been waiting for the two of them to appear. Every one of them now pretended, as though by common agreement, that they had hardly noticed their arrival. Mrs. Virginsky turned towards Stavrogin and asked him rather gruffly, Want some tea, Stavrogin? Yes, please. Give Stavrogin some tea, she said to her sister who was pouring it. And what about you, Verkovinsky? Sure I do. Anyway, what's the idea of asking guests whether they want tea? And put some more cream in mine this time. Somehow one always gets some unspeakable concoction in this house instead of tea, even at an anniversary or a christening. Why, you mean to say even you recognize christenings? The girl student laughed suddenly. We were just discussing it. That's old stuff, the schoolboy grunted from the opposite end of the table. What's old stuff? Trying to overcome superstitions is old stuff? I'm afraid it's still very topical to our great shame. The girl immediately responded to his challenge, leaning forward in her chair. Anyway, I say there are no harmless superstitions. All I meant to say, the schoolboy said, becoming terribly agitated, was that all those superstitions do, of course, belong to the past and must be done away with. A silly superstition like christening has been dealt with long ago, and everyone knows that it's stupid, so it's not worth wasting one's time on, and people's wits could be put to better use on more important subjects. You go on and on, it's impossible to make out what you're trying to say, the girl student shouted angrily. I thought everyone was entitled to express his opinion, and if I wish to express mine, I have just as much. No one is trying to deprive you of your right to speak. Now it was the mistress of the house who sharply interrupted the boy. You're simply being asked not to chatter like that because no one can understand what you're talking about. I'm afraid I must object. I'm not being treated with due courtesy in as much as I'm not being given an opportunity to finish my thought. It's not a lack of ideas, but rather that I have too many of them, the schoolboy muttered, almost despairing and getting completely mixed up. Well, if you don't know how to express yourself, just shut up, the girl student fired at him. The boy jumped up from his chair. I simply wish to state, he shouted, burning with shame and not daring to look around him, that you started all this just to display your wit as soon as Mr. Stavrogin came in. And that's the truth. That's a dirty, unfair thing to say, and it shows that you're still at an inferior stage of mental development. 
And from now on, I don't wish you to address me, the girl rattled off at full speed. Stavrogin, the mistress of the house said. Before you came in, they were arguing their heads off about family rights. This man here, she nodded in the direction of the major, was defending them. Of course, I haven't the slightest intention of bothering you with old rubbish like that, which has long since been settled. But I would like still to know where all those family rights and duties came from. I mean, was it in the form of the superstitions that have come down to us? Well, that's my question. What's your opinion on the subject? What do you mean, where did they come from? Why, just as we know, for instance, that the superstition about God comes from thunder and lightning, the girl student burst out again, her eyes all but leaping out of her head and flying at Stavrogin. Today it's well known that in their fear of thunder and lightning, primitive men deified the unseen enemy because they felt helpless before him. But where did the superstition about the family originate? Where does the notion of family come from? It's not quite the same thing, Mrs. Virginsky said, trying to restrain her sister-in-law. I'm afraid that an answer to that question would be rather indiscreet, Stavrogin said. What do you mean, the girl student said, bending forward in, in surprise. Titters came from the group of teachers, which were immediately echoed at the other end of the table by Lyamshin, the schoolboy, and, after a brief interval, by the major, who laughed hoarsely. You should write vaudeville sketches, Mrs. Brzezinski said to Stavrogin. A remark like that doesn't do you any credit, whatever your name is, the student declared, quite indignant now. Next time, don't jump at people like that, her uncle, the major, said to her. Remember, you're a young lady and should know how to behave. You see what happens when you insist on sitting down on a needle. I would appreciate it if you would also keep quiet and abstain from addressing me with such familiarity. And please spare me all your repulsive metaphors. I don't remember meeting you before, and I don't recognize you as a relative of mine. But I happen to be your uncle, and I carried you in my arms when you were a baby. I don't care who or what you may have carried in your arms. I never asked you to carry me around, Mr. Bad-Mannered Army Officer, so I must assume you did it for your own pleasure. And again, I must remind you that I won't tolerate your using that familiar tone with me. That's the way they all are, the Major said, banging his fist on the table and apparently addressing Stavrogin, who sat across the table from him. I must say I'm interested in liberalism and contemporary problems, and I like to listen to intelligent discussions, but I do wish it could be confined to men. I don't care to hear that sort of thing from these modern women. No, sorry, that's something I really can't stand. Stop wriggling, you, he shouted at the girl student, who was bouncing about in her chair. I'm also entitled to have my say. I've been slighted, remember? You only prevent others from talking. You have nothing to say yourself, the lady of the house muttered indignantly. No, I think I'll say what I have on my mind this time, the major said heatedly. I'm counting on you, Mr. Stavrogin, because you've just come in, although I don't have the honor of knowing you. I say that without men, they'd perish like a bunch of flies. All that stuff about the emancipation of women shows nothing but a lack of originality. I assure you that the whole fur was invented for them by men who in a moment of aberration, called the trouble down on themselves. I just thank God I'm not married. Women haven't the slightest ability to be original. They can't even invent a new design for their embroidery. Even for that, they call on men. Here, for instance, look at her. I carried her in my arms when she was a baby. I danced the mazurka with her when she was 10. And now when she arrived, I naturally rushed up to give her a big hug. And then the second thing she tells me is that there's no God. Well, I wouldn't mind it so much if it had been the third thing she said, but she had to blurt it out as soon as she'd said hello. All right, I can see that there may be intelligent people who don't believe in God. They arrive at that point by thinking it all out. But she's just a brat. What do you understand about God? I bet some fellow student taught you that stuff. If he had taught you to light sanctuary laps before icons, you'd have done that just as zealously. You're a liar and a spiteful man. I have already demonstrated the inconsistency of your views to you, the girl said scornfully as if it were beneath her dignity to talk to such a person. I told you that in catechism class, we were all taught that if you honor your father and mother, you'll live long and become rich. That comes in the Ten Commandments. Now, if God finds it necessary to offer people rewards for love, such a God must be considered immoral. That's how I proved my point to you. And I didn't just blurt it out as soon as I'd said hello. I simply said it because you made a claim on me. Now, whose fault is it if you're so stupid that you still can't understand? That makes you feel bad, and then you get furious, and that explains the behavior of all your generation. Silly goose, the major said, and you're a moron. Go on, insult me. But just a minute, major, Laputin squeaked from the other end of the table. I'm sure you told me yourself that you didn't believe in God. 
And suppose I did? It's a different matter for me. I perhaps do believe in God. Although not completely. But even if I don't quite believe, I'd still never go around saying that God ought to be shot. When I was still living in the Hussars, I often used to wonder about God. And all the songs that Hussar drinks and has a great time and all that. But believe me, even then, although I may have actually drunk a lot, I often jumped up from my bed at night and stood in my socks, crossing myself before the icon and beseeching God to give me faith because even then I couldn't prevent myself from worrying about whether or not God existed. Yes, I had a rough time of it. In the morning, of course, one got distracted and faith vanished, as it were. Yes, in general, I've noticed that in daylight, faith seems to decrease. Do you have a pack of cards by any chance? Verkovinsky asked the mistress of the house, yawning quite openly. I'm in full sympathy with your question, the girl student cried, growing crimson with indignation at the major. Precious time is being wasted on stupid talk, Mrs. Virginsky broke in, looking reproachfully at her husband. The girl student drew herself up. I wanted to inform the meeting about the suffering of the students and about their protest. Now, since time has been wasted on idle and immoral discussion, there isn't any such thing as moral or immoral, the schoolboy said, unable to restrain himself once the girl student had opened her mouth. I'm well aware of that, Mr. Schoolboy, and knew it long before they taught you about it. But I claim, the boy rejoined fiercely, that you're nothing but a brat and that you don't have to tell us things we know already just because you happen to have come from Petersburg. As to the commandment, honor thy father and mother, which you misquoted, everyone in Russia has known it's immoral ever since Belinsky explained that it was. Will this nonsense never end, Mrs. Virginsky said in a determined tone to her husband. Being the mistress of the house, she felt personally ashamed of, at the silliness of the arguments particularly since she'd noticed a few smiles and bewildered glances exchanged between the last two arrivals. Ladies and gentlemen, Virginsky said suddenly, raising his voice, if any one of you wishes to speak about something that is more closely connected with the business at hand, or if he has some declaration to make, I suggest he proceed without further delay. I'd like if I may to ask one question, said the lame teacher, who till then had sat in dignified silence. I would like to know whether a lot of us gathered here constitute a business meeting or whether we're just a bunch of ordinary mortals come to visit friends. I ask this mostly as a matter of form, but also to dispel any possible misconceptions. This sly question produced its effect. Glances were exchanged, each one expecting the other to answer. Finally, however, everyone somehow wound up staring at Verkovinsky and Stavrogin. I suggest we simply take a vote on the question of whether or not we are an official meeting, Mrs. Virginsky said. I second the motion, Laputin said, although it is somewhat vaguely worded. I second it too. Me too, several voices were heard. Yes, I think it would contribute to a more orderly procedure, Virginsky said in approval. Then let's vote, the mistress of the house declared. You, Lyonshin, please go and sit down at the piano. You'll be able to cast your vote from there when the balloting begins. What, again? Lyonshin protested. Haven't I thumped it often enough for you, as it is? I earnestly request you to sit down and play, unless you no longer wish to be useful to the cause. But I promise you, Mrs. Virginsky, no one is eavesdropping. It's sheer imagination on your part. And with these high windows... You could understand what's going on here. Who could understand what's going on here, even if he tried to listen in? We can't understand it ourselves, someone grumbled. But we must always take every possible precaution. I'm thinking of possible spies. She explained, turning to Verkovinsky. They'll think we really are having a birthday party when they hear the piano. Ah, oh, damn it, Lyamshin swore. He sat down at the piano and played a waltz, almost banging the keys with his fists. 
Those who wish this gathering to be an official meeting, raise your right hands, Mrs. Brzezinski sang out. Some raised their right hands, others didn't. There were also some who, after raising them at first, at once put them down again. Oh, hell, I don't understand a damn thing, an army officer cried. Neither do I, another said. I do, someone else announced. If it's I, you raise your hand. But what does I mean? It means we're having an official meeting. No, this isn't an official meeting. I voted for an official meeting, the schoolboy shouted, addressing Mrs. Brzezinski. So why didn't you raise your hand? I was watching you, and since you didn't raise yours, I didn't raise mine. Very stupid of you. I didn't raise mine because I proposed the motion. Ladies and gentlemen, I suggest we start all over again this time. Those for the meeting, sit quiet and don't raise your hands. Those against, raise your right hands. Those against, the schoolboy asked. Why, you must be doing it on purpose, Mrs. Virginsky shouted angrily. Now, just a minute, ma'am. Are those who want this to be a meeting or those who don't supposed to raise their right hands? Let's have it clear now. Two or three voices rose in protest. Those who do not want it. That's plain enough, but what are they supposed to do? Raise them or not raise them? One of the officers cried in despair. Oh, it doesn't look as if we're quite right for a constitution yet, the major remarked. Please, Mr. Lyamshin, take it easy. The way you bang, we can't hear a word of what's going on, the lame teacher pleaded. I assure you, Mrs. Virginsky, no one is trying to eavesdrop, Lyamshin said, jumping up from his stool. Anyway, I don't want to play all the time. I came here as a guest, not a drummer. Ladies and gentlemen, Virginsky suggested, just speak up now. Are we a meeting or aren't we? We are, we are, came from all sides. All right, then, there's no need to vote on it. Enough of that. Are you all satisfied or does someone feel we should still vote? No need, no need, we understand. Perhaps someone among you doesn't wish this to be a meeting. No, no, we all want a meeting. But what does it mean, a meeting, someone inquired, but he received no reply. We must elect a chairman, voices came from all directions. The master of the house, of course, Virginsky. Well, if that is your wish, ladies and gentlemen, the elected chairman began. I will repeat my original proposal. If there's anyone here who has something to say more closely connected with the business at hand, let him do so without any further waste of time. A general silence followed, during which all eyes gradually wound up focused expectantly on Verkovinsky and Stavrogin again. Don't you have a statement to make for Verkovinsky? The mistress of the house asked point blank. No, none at all, he answered, stretching in his chair and yawning. Unless... Wait, I think I would like a glass of brandy. And how about you, Stavrogin? No, thank you, really. I don't drink. I didn't mean about the brandy. I was asking you whether you wanted to speak. About what? No, I don't. They'll bring me some brandy, Mrs. Brzezinski told Verkovinsky. The girl student stood up. She had made several previous attempts to be recognized. I have come here to report on the sufferings among underprivileged students and on ways to rouse them to protest all over the country, but she stopped short. But she stopped short. At the opposite end of the table, Another speaker had materialized and all eyes turned toward him. The long-eared Shigalov, looking gloomy and morose, slowly got to his feet and with a sad expression placed a voluminous, closely written notebook on the table. He stood there in complete silence. Many looked with surprise at the notebook. Laputin, Virginsky, and the lame teacher, however, seemed very pleased about something. I'd like to address the meeting, Shigalov said mournfully but firmly. You have the floor, Virginsky said, authorizing him to speak. The speaker sat down, remained silent another half minute, and then said in a grave voice, Ladies and gentlemen, here's that brandy, Mrs. Virginsky's sister, who had been pouring the tea, announced in a scornful and disgusted tone. She brought a bottle and a glass that she carried between her fingers without tray or saucer and put them in front of Verkovinsky. The interrupted orator looked around with offended dignity. Never mind, go on. I wasn't listening anyway, Verkovinsky shouted, pouring brandy into his glass. Ladies and gentlemen, Shigalov started again. I request your attention, and as you will see later, I ask for your assistance in a matter of prime importance. But first of all, I must say a few words to introduce my main point. Say, Mrs. Virginsky, do you have a pair of scissors by any chance? Peter Verkovinsky asked suddenly. What do you want scissors for? 
she asked, looking at, looking at him pop-eyed. I forgot to cut my nails. I've been meaning to do it for three days, Rukovinsky said, examining his long, rather dirty nails with detachment. Mrs. Virginsky flushed with anger, but Miss Virginsky, the student, seemed to enjoy Peter's interruption. I believe I saw them over there on the windowsill, she announced. She got up, found the scissors, and brought them to Peter, who took them without even looking at her and started working on his nails. Mrs. Virginsky thought there must be a reason for Peter's action and suddenly became ashamed of her first reaction. The members of the meeting exchanged glances in silence. The lame teacher watched Verkovinsky spitefully and enviously. Shigalov went on, his, went on with his speech. Having devoted all my energies to a study of the social organization that will supersede the present one in the future society, I have come to the conclusion that all those who have devised social systems from antiquity down to this very year have been nothing but dreamers, writers of fairy tales, and fools, who have contradicted themselves because they have understood nothing about the natural sciences or about that strange animal called man. Plato, Rousseau, Fourier, aluminum pillars, all that may be fit for sparrows, but certainly not for human society. But we need to know what the future organization of society will be, especially now that we are about to go over to action. So we won't have to think any more about it. I therefore wish to propose my own system of world organization. It is all in here, he announced, slapping the notebook in front of him. I had hoped it would be possible to present my book to this meeting in abbreviated form. But I realize now that I will have to add many more oral explanations, so I estimate that a comprehensive presentation will take at least ten evening sessions, one for each chapter of my work. Some laughter from the audience. Furthermore, I must warn you that my system is not yet complete. More laughter. I have become entangled in my own data, and my conclusions directly contradict my original premises. I started out with the idea of unrestricted freedom, and I have arrived at unrestricted despotism. I must add, however, that any solution of the social problem other than mine is impossible. The laughter grew louder and louder, but it was the young, the obviously less indoctrinated ones, who laughed the most. Mrs. Virginsky, Laputin, and the lame teacher looked rather annoyed. But if you yourself have failed to develop an acceptable system and even despair of arriving at one, what then are we supposed to do? One of the officers inquired cautiously. Well, you have a good point there, Mr. Officer, Shigalov answered cuttingly, and you're right to use the word despair. Yes, I was in despair, but that doesn't alter the fact that what is written in this book cannot be changed and that no one else will ever find a way out. So I invite all those gathered here to devote ten evenings to the study of my book and afterward to express their opinions on the subject. Now, if the meeting refuses to listen to me, we'd better speak up here and now. Let the men go back to serving the state and the women return to their kitchens because if they don't accept my book, they'll never find any other solution. There is none. If they miss the opportunity I am offering them, they will only hurt themselves because they are bound to have to face the facts later. So everything boils down to Shigalov's despair, Lymshin concluded. And thus the outstanding question is whether Shigalov should or should not despair? Shigalov's despair is a private matter, the schoolboy declared. I propose we take a vote on whether Shigalov's despair has a bearing upon the state of our common cause and whether we should spend so many evenings listening to him or not, an officer said cheerfully.